Dean Fine, uh, we have introduced him. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Rebecca Morrison. Uh, so Rebecca has her PhD from UT Austin uh, in 2016, where she did her PhD in computational sciences. Uh, since then, she has been a postdoc at MIT for two years in aeronautics, astronautics department, and she joined uh, Paul 2018, and she's been here ever since. Uh, Rebecca's work is on uh, problems that involve uh, Bayesian inference, probabilistic models, and dynamical systems. Uh, she has a background in uncertainty quantification as well. So she works in a wide variety of areas that are of great interest to a lot of people in computer science. And uh, her work recently has also won some awards. So she won two best paper awards in two different conferences involving two of her students last year. So, so she's, she's been on a roll getting awards and doing amazing things uh, about structure and sparsity that you will hear about right now. So thank you. OK, great. Thank you so much. I think I actually had a dream two nights ago that something very similar happened to what we just went through. So, but we made it out. Okay, so let's move on. So, can I? Do I tempt fate? Yeah. So, was that good for the whole talk? Actually, okay. So, what? Let's just look at this for a minute. What do? What are some things we notice? What are some things you notice? Yeah. The atmosphere, love it. The Earth's atmosphere. What else? City lights. City lights, yeah. Anything else that's gone now? There it is. Sa satellite, yeah. Yeah, those are the, the main three I wanted to notice. So, yeah, so I love this video. This is from NASA, and it just, uh, just shows these really complex systems that are of great interest to us. Right, like a satellite orbiting the Earth, maybe involved in telecommunications or fire detection or the Earth's atmosphere that affects weather and climate and the power grid and everything that goes into that. And so when we think about these systems, the scientists, we want to know how do we really make sense of these? How do we, how do we make predictions about them? How do we make reliable predictions about them? And that's what I want to try to start to answer today. That's obviously a very big question, but let's just think about that today. Okay, so again, how do we make sense of these complex systems and hopefully one day make predictions that we can then trust? So basically, just by doing what scientists have done for hundreds of years, the scientific method, right? But now we're gonna update it with computation. And that was a term, the third pillar, a term coined by Dr. Tinsley Odin uh, who was at UT Austin, who actually passed away a couple days ago, who was one of the founders of computational science. And he said, you know, science isn't just theory and experiment anymore, it's computation too. And also now we're seeing big data come into that. Um, okay, so that's what we're gonna try to do. And within that framework, I wanna look for models that obey, of course, whatever constraints we have, whatever structure we know has to be there. We don't want to break that. So we want to obey whatever given physical or mathematical constraints we have. And then we want to try to exploit or promote sparsity in the system because we want to find a model that's rich enough to describe what's going on, but not too rich, right? We want to be able to use it in different situations. We want to be able to extrapolate, use this model for predictions. So we like to find things as simple as possible, but as rich as necessary. Okay, and then we need to test these models through rigorous calibration, validation, and prediction processes. Okay, in this talk, I'm gonna go through sort of two different sections. One, about probabilistic graphical models where we're looking for sparse interactions among the variables, among random variables. And the other part is about dynamical systems where we're looking for sparse representations of the coupled dynamics. It's another type of sparse interaction. Okay, but first I just wanna tell a little story. Okay, so here I was with my office mate, Honor Bun, at the end of my postdoc. It's the end of the week. You can see we've been really working really hard. <laughs> We're tired. And I had just given a talk about modeling these uncertain systems where, now, it, 
red, this red dotted line, you see what we call the detailed model. That's like our ground truth. The orange is some reduced model that maybe someone wants to use, but that's not a very good model of the truth. And so our work was about, well, we need to start with this reduced model and then using data from that, using data from the true system, we'll try to correct it. And so that was a nice example of when you could do that well. And this researcher, Americo Cunha, came up to me after this talk and he said, look, I've got like the same plots, basically. I have the same problem. And this is what, sorry, let me try to get rid of that. This is what his system was. Oh, you can't see that at all. Can I move this? Okay, great. Okay, so this is what that system was. It was a Zika outbreak in Brazil in 2016. And in, okay, what's this graph? This is the cumulative number of cases of Zika reported along, here we have along the epidemiological week. And the blue triangles are data that's actually coming from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. And so America and his collaborators wanted to try to model the system. And they started with, these standard SEI, SDIR models, very common in epidemiology. And they took these models and they said, let's just plug in sort of the best parameters, the ones that we can find that have been researched really well, even come with uncertainty bounds. Let's put those in and see what that tells us. And they got this orange line. Okay, so severe under prediction here. Then America went and said, well, Let's use those as a starting point, but then try to calibrate them to this data and get a better fit. And they did two different types of calibrations, and they got this green and purple lines. And you can see it's, a, it's much better, but there's still sort of this pretty big discrepancy between the data and the model. Okay, so we started working together. What these models look like are a set of coupled ordinary differential equations. I'll just call that as DXT, DT. There's some reduced model that I'll call R, script R here. And so that model just wasn't working. And so what we did is we embedded this enrichment operator. The enrichment operator changes the model equations, but it still respects whatever you know about the system. You can calibrate it to data, but because it's part of the model and not just a correction to the model output, now you can start ex exporting it to other scenarios and make extrapolative predictions. And you know that you're not gonna recover all of your missing dynamics. So you just wanna recover a sparse set of missing dynamics. And using that, we got a much better, better fit. We have some uncertainty bounds and that showed up in these papers here. And then we had some code, a, a larger uh, sort of UQ for epidemiology code that's described in that second paper. Then we can do other things too, like we know that uh, outbreaks, diseases tend to be severely underreported. This is, we modified the data and repeated the process with 50% underreported, underreporting. Um, it was estimated that in that Zika outbreak in 2016 that the underreport, underreporting might have been as high as 90%, but um, anyway, okay. Okay, so now that was part of the second part of the talk, but it's just kind of a little story to get us going. Now we're gonna talk about graphs. Okay, so here, what is a graph? A, gra a probabilistic graphical model, undirected, is a set of vertices V and edges E. A node corresponds to a random variable, and the lack of an edge is really important. The lack of an edge represents conditional independence. So we say IJ is not an edge set, if xi and xj are conditionally independent given something, that something can have different flavors, but you can think of it as a separator set, which is a set that if you move along a path from i to j, you must go through that set. Okay, so here's an example of a star graph. So this mid central node one is a separator set for any other of the other two nodes. And we can write that as x, I is conditionally independent from xj given x1. So 
This is also the assumption that goes into naive Bayes. Maybe some of you have used that for classification problems or in my probabilistic modeling class. Um, and this is a really nice model that simplifies things a lot. So let's think about it. Let's say we had 100 variables, which for many problems is you know, a decent size, but maybe not even that big. And let's say each of them, let's think about discrete random variables for a second. Let's say they each have six possible states. Why did I pick six? Let's see, okay. So with the star graph, if you know this structure, if you actually want to describe your probability distribution completely, give a full account of your probability density for all 100 variables, you need something on the order of 100 parameters, a constant times 100. Okay, order 100 parameters. So describe this thing completely, your entire distribution, everything you want to know. If you don't have this graph, what happens? Well, then it in general, the amount of parameters, the degrees of freedom to describe that probability distribution is exponential in the number of variables. So you're looking at six to 100. So I picked these numbers because that's approximately the number of atoms in the universe. Okay, so we obviously don't want to compute with that. We have that big data, but we don't have that big of data. Okay, here's another really common example, um, this 2D lattice. This is called a grid graph or an icing model. This shows up in a lot in statistical physics. It also shows up a lot in imaging. Um, you think of these as pixels. And so a common assumption is to say, well, if I want to know the pixel value or if I want to know if this dipole is spin up or spin down, I can, if I can just condition on its neighbors, I can forget the rest of the graph, no matter how big that thing is. OK, and then one last thing about general thing about graphs. Conditional dependence does not mean the same thing as correlation. This is a very common misconception. So let's imagine that our random variables are these four temperatures tomorrow at noon in these four cities. San Luis Obispo in California, that's where I grew up. Boulder, Fort Collins, and Denver. And now, if you were just to look at any two of these, the temperature in those places, they're all correlated. There's they, those all are gonna have some positive correlation. But if I, in my mind, I was gonna do, I don't remember. Chad, what did we say yesterday? We were going over this. I think I was gonna make Denver over here. I don't know. Okay, I, my geography is not very good. So let's say if I can condition on Fort Collins and Boulder, I don't need to know Denver anymore to predict the weather in San Luis Obispo. Okay, you get the idea, I'll work on that. Okay, now last thing, just a tiny little bit of notation that we're gonna keep the rest of the talk. I'm gonna talk a lot about probability densities. Now just we're moving into the world of strictly continuous densities. So I want a standard normal, that's eta. I want a multivariate normal, standard normal with mean zero and just identity covariance multivariate normal rho with mean zero again, but some non-trivial covariance sigma. And now, as in general, non-Gaussian target distribution pi. We don't know what it is, but we can assume it's zero mean and positive over the reals. So what does the graph really represent? We saw these pictures is talking about telling us about conditional independence between variables. That structure is really nice. We wanna use it. We want to know what it is if we're going to do other things like inference and prediction. But the, sort of the most fundamental thing is that the density now can be written as a product of potentials, these functions, think function, over maximal clicks in the graph. So here I've written pi as a product over the clicks, little c in my set, click capital C, of these potential functions, phi of c. And those potential functions, even them just depend on the subset of variables. Okay, and the click is a complete subgraph. And then we've got our partition, partition function z right here. Okay, so like we saw in the, you know, the star graph example, this having the structure is really critical if we wanna do anything with multivariate distributions, basically. But what if we don't know the graph? 
know, in some cases you get your image, you know where the pixels are, great. You know a, a good assumption for what the graph is. But what if you're just getting data? You're just collecting data from a bunch of variables and you don't know what the graph is. You want to find it, you want to find it. So for a multivariate normal, it's known. It's been known for a long time and it's easy to prove that there's no edge ij in your edge set E if and only if the ij entry of the precision matrix is zero. You can think in your exponential, if there's a zero, those things separate into like E to the something over here and E to the something over here, and you can separate them into different potentials. Okay. In general, that doesn't hold anymore. You can't just look at precision. But in general, what's true is that, which is a recent result um, that came out from Alessio Scantini, and, uh, who was also in Yusef Marzouk's group. Um, in general, what is true is that there's no edge in our edge set if and only if this mixed partial derivative of the log density is zero everywhere. And I wanted to say, this is all joint work now with Ricardo Baptista, who's at Caltech, Olivia Zam at, um, in Grenoble, and Yusef at MIT. So <clears throat> that's, that's good that we know this. What, what's the problem with this? In the Gaussian case, you can just compute that directly from data. You can compute an empirical co covariance from data and then take the inverse. Um, and it's just a scalar. Right, that's just, I mean, the entry of the matrix is just, it's just a scalar and that thing is just a matrix. Here and now we have this function, but we have to check that it's zero for all X. So if we're in a bunch of, you know, a bunch of dimensions, we don't wanna do that. So what we did is we said, well, let's just find a conditional independent score. We're gonna take this quantity, we're gonna square it so things can't cancel out. And then we're gonna take the expectation over pi. And now we still have a nice if and only if, We'll call this matrix omega. Now we still have a nice, you can think of an if and only if right here. This edge is not there, if and only if this thing is zero. Okay. Technically, I mean, this the almost surely. I don't want to leave anything. You told me less math. <laughs> All right. <laughs> This is the less math version. Okay. So what's the catch? The catch is to compute this thing, we need to be able to write down what pi is. But I just said we don't know what pi is, we're just getting data. We want to find the graph, we're just getting data. So we don't have an expression for pi. If we had a nice expression for pi, we could just look at those potentials. But we don't. Okay, so we have to solve that problem first. And to do that, we use what are called transport maps. I'll tell you what a transport map is on the next slide, but we'll come back to that. But let's assume now that we can do that density estimation. We can have an expression for pi. Now we get to our algorithm. We call this NSYNC for non-iterative sparsely identification of non-Gaussian distributions. It's a mouthful. And what are the basic steps? We use our transport maps to build the sensi estimate. And then once we have that, we just plug and check. We compute this numerical estimate of omega, call it omega hat. Then we have to threshold that. That's an extremely interesting problem. Very difficult, actually. Um, I'm not gonna talk about it anymore, <laughs> but we can talk about it after. And then once we do that, then we just return the edge set from the sparsity of the thresholded omega hat. Okay, so this thing is called non-iterative, so that sounds like probably there's an iterative version. There is. Why would we iterate? There's this really beautiful connection between the sparsity of the graph and what we call the sparsity of the transport map. Come talk to me after if you want to know more about that. It helps, helps our computation, helps speed things up to iterate. Um, I just want to point out, this is to the best of our knowledge. Well, really the first and only consistent estimator, the graph for general continuous distributions. Okay, and there's a couple of papers here. Okay, so what's a transport map? A transport map, here's a multivariate distribution. Here's a multivariate distribution. And a map, a transport map is just a deterministic map from one to the other. So here we're in the, we're a Gaussian world. 
here, we're in our non-Gaussian world pi, and we use this map T that has this funny symbol sharp that we call this the push forward of the map, and that's the pullback of the map. But anyway, this map it just is a deterministic coupling between two probabilities. The kth component of the map looks like this crazy thing. You don't have to read it, but just know that that parameterization of the map depends on polynomials, on or really on Hermit functions. You have to specify an order of those polynomials, and that's really important, and I'm going to call that order beta. So beta is a positive integer, and that's all you have to remember from this slide. What's the role of beta? If beta is 1, I have a linear map, and I map back and forth from one Gaussian to another. That's all I can do, linear map. Think Cholesky factor, moving you back and forth from one normal to another. OK, Cholesky factor of your covariance or your precision. Beta is greater than one, then we have a nonlinear map, and now we can start, you know, we can start mapping to things that are non-Gaussian like that banana that we just saw. OK. All right, so let's do an example. So let's consider pairs PI and QI of random variables. PI, standard normal. QI is PI times another standard normal. And the graph just looks like these dumbbells. This is just a matrix representation of that graph. And here are your 1 and 2D marginals. This is standard normal. This is not standard normal, but it doesn't look too far off, right? It's symmetric. It's unimodal, tails die out really quickly, a lot of things that characteristics that it shares with a normal. But you can see the 2D one has 2D marginal has this butterfly shape. Okay. In the iteration that I didn't talk about of the algorithm, the ordering of the variables is really important. So we permuted the order so that our algorithm would have to find a good ordering. I know I didn't talk about that, but that's what's going on there. And then we said, okay, let's try our algorithm sing with beta equals three. So to allow for that non-linearity, we get the correct graph. After a couple iterations, we get the correct graph. Then we tried it with, what if we thought, you know, what if we just looked at the 1D marginals and maybe we thought it was normal? Or a lot of times people just assume things are normal because a lot of times they are, but sometimes they're not. Anyway. So what if you try with beta equals one? That means you're assuming the data is normal. Well, you get the worst possible thing. You miss all of your edges. So if someone gave you this data set and you gave them this graph back, you'd say, look, this is great. You don't have any dependence. You don't have any conditional dependence. You can treat all of these things independently when that's very much not the case. OK. OK. So. Now a surprise. OK, again, you don't have to read this math. But what's going on? This is another example where it's called a Gaussian copula or non-normal. It's a great name. And so x, x here is coming from pi. And what do you do? You take a, you take a what's called, what we call a diagonal transformation of x, one variable at a time f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, one time. And when you do that, you get back to a normal, OK? So you're like this diagonal transformation away from a normal. And we know it's very easy to show that x or pi inherits the same graph as f of x, your normal. And you know what the normal is, because you know what the covariance and the precision are. OK. So here's a 1D marginal. You can see this thing is super non-Gaussian, right? It's got these two modes. It's... Anyway, yeah, you can see it. And to sample, just to show you, OK, we've got nested integrals. We have a square. We have a square root. Like, it's awful. This does not look linear. So we're going to use this as a test case. This is a good test case for, or is thought to be a good test case for non-Gaussian algorithms, learning algorithms, because you know what the graph is because you're designing it. But when the data comes in, it looks, you know, it really looks non-Gaussian. Here's the true graph. Yeah. No, definitely not. Yeah. In, yeah, yes. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, in this case, you can invert it. We, I mean, um, in, but it actually does not, let, let me keep going. Yeah. But you don't, you, you don't actually need invertibility really for some, some results to still hold here. Our, our transport maps are always invertible. We'll make them. But but these things that people are coming with, up with are not necessarily always invertible. Okay, so here's the true graph. We applied. We started with beta equals two, and we got it. So we, okay, well, looks. We thought maybe we'd have to go pretty high with beta, but I guess beta equals two is enough. We're getting it, so that's good. And then we said, okay, let's just see sort of how bad this thing is going to be when we use beta equals one, because this thing is not looking Gaussian and we still got the correct graph. So this was a big surprise. Right off the bat, we said, well, let's look at the precision matrix. And you can see this like remnant of the graph in the precision matrix. OK, so why? So why is this happening? So this is joint work with Estelle Baster at American Institute of Mathematics and again with Ricardo. And what we found was that these diagonal transformations essentially preserve the structure of the covariance and the precision matrices. So the, yeah, those 1D marginals can look totally bizarro, but the covariance, the precision matrix matrices still sort of look like what they used to look like. And so just to say that a little more specifically, so if this is, this is our starting precision matrix, sigma inverse of rho, we want to say, well, if we do this transformation, what happens on, What happens from here to here, right? What, what is the precision? We're seeing that this precision of pi looks the same. How do we prove that? But I don't know how to write down entries of a precision matrix explicitly as more than the inverse of the covariance. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the inverse first. If this precision matrix, this is not a big assumption, and not a very harsh assumption that you start with I plus B inverse, or I plus B is your starting precision. You take that inverse to get you to your covariance. Now in this work, we actually do this, I think really nice exact analysis that tells you if you have, if an entry here is look, say sigma IJ, I'll tell you exactly what the entry of my new covariance is, exactly. And then once I have that, now I take my inverse again. And what we saw is that if that thing looks like I plus B, this new one looks like a constant times I plus a constant times B plus some error. And we kept track of that error. And we showed that the structure is preserved. OK. I'm going to go really quickly through some extensions from this work. So now about that. Getting back to Roth's question, now about that, what did we assume in that last paper about this transformation F? We assumed it's odd. Now we can handle even and even and odd. Before we just had all of them be the same function. Now we can have let them be different functions. And maybe the um, in a way, the biggest assumption was that all of the derivatives of this function at zero were bounded. But now we're looking at a broader class of functions and trying to relax that. Because clearly in that example I showed you with the non-paranormal, it didn't fit these assumptions and you still see the same behavior. So now we're trying to actually prove that for this broader class of functions. And the sort of um, big question here is suppose we can approximate the function. Maybe you don't know exactly what the function is, but maybe we can approximate it like with a sequence of polynomials. Then tau ij, sorry, that. Um, a remnant, that's in the entry of my new covariance. What does tau ij converge to? Um, another extension I'm looking at with um, Pan and Yota, but Harriet Watt is this now a directed graph setup where you can think about a causal structure. And so now each, like if you look at each xi, it's some mean term plus some linear combination of the variables x1 through xi minus one plus some error. Well. If in matrix form, it looks like x equals lambda x plus mu plus epsilon. I'm going to let mu be 0, move x to my other side, 
And this, I minus lambda, lambda is a matrix that collects all these little lambda coefficients. This is a strictly, uh, lambda is strictly triangular. This is a lower triangular, excuse me, strictly lower triangular. This is a lower triangular matrix. And that's what we love in our transport map setup. That's exactly the type of map we like to work with. And so now we can try to actually learn. Maybe a lot of these little lambdas drop out. Let's try to find a sparse, a sparse map here that satisfies this causal structure. OK. Density estimation is hard in any dimension, especially in more than one dimension. And I just don't even want to do it. I mean, transport maps are great, but I don't want to do that if I don't have to. And so the thing that's so nice about that non-paranormal example is that we didn't, you could, you could just look at the precision matrix. You didn't have to do density estimation to still find the graph. And we've seen that in other examples too. So I wanna, that transport map setup is expensive. I wanna get rid of that. If I notice that, let me call this now omega prime. I got rid of the square. This is my generalized precision. Omega, in the Gaussian case, omega prime is just equal to negative, COVID, negative precision. We saw for the non-paranormal, it's like the precision plus some error for it was small error. There's another res recent result, not ours. I can give you the reference if you'd like for multivariate T distribution that shows that the, this generalized precision looks like the precision plus the kurtosis is like higher moments now, second moment, fourth moment, plus some error. And so in all these cases, you can find your graph just from the data without doing density estimation. So we, we'd like to generalize this result. And I'm working on that um, with Peter. Oh, and that's Peter with my son, Max, last year playing piano. OK. OK, another application that Teo has been working on is using this graph learning approach to actually decouple multi-physics computational codes. So here's a code for a fire detection satellite model. It's got three different um, disciplines, subdisciplines, orbit, attitude, and power. And you can actually take data from the coupling variables of the system and see that you can decouple the model. This is actually consistent with other results that people had seen who worked on specifically decoupling this model. <clears throat> Okay. Something that Sam here is working on this year for a senior thesis is here is actually written out with some the proper constants that we use. If our original precision looks like I plus B, this new precision looks like this <laughs> with some constants, lambda and kappa. And those depend on the function. And this error term depends on the size of your graph. So now we're going to say, well, what if we what if we know we have a chain graph, for example? What happens to do our estimates get better as the graph gets bigger for a specific function? You know, what can we say about that? It'd be nice if things got easier as you get bigger, which sometimes happens when things look Gaussian. Okay, and then finally, um, another way to avoid density estimation is by trying to do what's called a neighborhood selection algorithm. So you know, start at one node, try to le learn its neighborhood move to another node and try to learn its neighborhood and then piece them together. Okay, and now very quickly, we're gonna talk about dynamic systems. Okay. Okay, here are some dynamical systems. The ones I wanna point out here, are the, com the combustion going on here. Here's my, I can't look at pictures of real mosquitoes. So there's the mosquito and this fox hunting. And what's, what, what goes on here? Okay, in reality, in this combustion process, there may be hundreds of chemical species, but to model that, maybe modelers use just the reactants and the products. So instead of 200 species, I'm gonna talk about five. The reality in the Zika case is unknown. What are actually the important variables? These SEIR models use humans and mosquitoes and subpopulations there, but what about um, other primates and livestock and other things, th those play a role too and can carry and spread the disease, but they're typically omitted from these models. Here you may have an entire ecosystem affecting the population of your rabbits, but you're just gonna model the rabbits and the foxes. So these reduced models of these ordinary differential equations show up all over the place. 
And so we know they're reduced and they're still being used. So we should check, Do they are they really faithfully representing the system? We should answer that with a formal validation process. And if they're not, then we need to represent that model form error, not by going up to back to 200 chemical species because no one who's doing turbulent combustion is gonna ever use that, you know, and actually in a real, you know, co anyway, and well, maybe to, in some cases, but you need these reduced models. So we wanna represent it with a sparse representation. Okay, and so here's an example that Riley has been working on where, so in this kind of mathematical ecology framework, maybe you have 20 species, you have all of these interaction terms, but in this example, you're just modeling three of them. And so again, it's the same framework. You have this reduced set of coupled differential equations that looks like this. Um, here's our reduced set, and we're gonna add this enrichment operator into the equations. And this is just a plot showing that basically, if the model were perfect, we'd like these bands to line, excuse me, line up here. And you can see that we're sort of approaching that line. Um, anyway, here's another example Riley's worked on with spring mass damper where there are lots of complicated mechanic systems that people say, oh, let's model with a spring mass damper with one, one mass. When maybe there's two, maybe there's 10, maybe there's 100. And so this was a um, nice result where there, the reduction was just from two to one. Um, we sort of had this nice representation of what was missing. This just exponential de decaying, excuse me, decaying cosine form for the mass that was left out. Um, and that was a really nice work by Riley. Here's another um, combustion example. Again, slowly time. You have this reduced model. We're going to add this uh, enrichment operator into it. This is a good example because when you start messing with uh, combustion kinetics, you can't break things like conservation of atoms, conservation of energy, and so on. So there's a lot of physical constraints that go into that operator. And here we are actually able to export this to a real prediction scenario to predict a flame speed of a 1D uh, hydrogen flame. Zika fits into this framework. Okay, so I jumped ahead just then to model error, but before we even get to count presenting model form error, if we have it, first I skipped that you really should probably need to do calibration first. What is calibration? Calibration is a type of inverse problem where you're calculating from observations what caused those observations, right? So you get measurements of shock waves at the surface of the earth and you wanna infer what happened, you know, a kilometer underneath the earth's surface from those observations. So they tend to be kind of challenging problems. Sometimes the calibration is just something we do along the way, but sometimes it turns into a very interesting research project in and of itself. Here's, um, one of those that Teo has worked on, the calibration of these complex chaotic models. And he realized that what's usually thought when you're working with these chaotic models is that you have to run everything for a really, really long time so you know what's happening on average. And what Teo has seen is that actually you can get a lot of information just by looking at very small snippets from your model. And we can use that to get really fast speed ups in our calibration. Here's another thing with Riley and um, other collaborators to try to sort of calibrate the uncertainty on top of space weather models. Um, Riley is now extending this to where we have these sort of extreme events and this sort of non-Gaussian behavior here, and we wanna be able to capture that. And so this is a toy example where she can capture this nice sort of biased uh, observational error. I've also worked on some theory, more theoretical um, stuff in inverse problems. This was with Peter, and we were actually able to give closed form solutions for posteriors that did not previously have <laughs> analytic solutions. So people said, well, I have this approximate solution, but they didn't actually know what they were converging to, and we were able to give, write, write down what it was, so that was nice. Okay, and then, 
This is the last bit. So in all, I've been working with these reduced models now for a while. And it's always been nagging at me. Why do these, not nagging, but I've always wondered, why do these reduced models even work as well as they do in the first place? I mean, some, some team is trying to model turbulent combustion and they know there are all hundreds of chemical species and they say, that, oh, well, we're just gonna use five. So, you know, maybe there's still some error there, but they're still doing a pretty good job. And it's like, why are they doing such a good job in the first place? So I've always been wondering about that. I started to get to an answer in um, 2020 with this type of exact reduction. So here's the system that I wanna think about. Here's my set of ODEs. This right-hand side just means that you can have linear and quadratic terms. So that's it. And I showed here that you can reduce, you can do this exact reduction from say a large number of species N to a smaller number of species M. You can do it exactly, but a lot of your interaction terms ha might have to be zero. So if you let these sum set be zero, then you can reduce with, without loss of information. Exactly, perfectly, down. Okay, so that was the start of an answer. That was answer one. But this was a little bit still not satisfying because this set may be large to do this reduction. And it's still just hard to say anything about these differential equations because you don't have an analytic solution. Okay, and then Sriram did tell me to take this slide out, but I left it in because and this is my most recent result and I'm so proud of it. So we're just, and I said, don't worry. I know at 4.30 on Thursday afternoon, everybody was gonna wanna hear about eigenvalues. <laughs> we're gonna do it. Okay, so here's my second answer. Analytic solutions via spectral power series. A is this interaction matrix. Let that be invertible. C is minus inverse A inverse B. C is my equilibrium values of all my species as a vector. Lambda is a vector of the eigenvalues of the matrix made up of the diagonal of C A. No problem. We got our eigenvalues. We're gonna assume the eigenvalues are real, negative, and there are no like copies, no solutions to z dot lambda equals zero. So you can't have you know a fourth and a half because then things will start to repeat. Okay, so all right. And then what we proved here is that there exists a time, T naught, such that after that time, if you write your solution here in this sort of power series form, where you have coefficients times what, times this exponential with this inner product between n or just integers and these eigenvalues from, that, those are eigenvalues from your linearized system times t, that this solution converges for all t greater than that t naught. Okay, so, that's really exciting because this is, well, I can, now I can look at this. I don't have to use a runga kata to tell you what x at time t equals five is. I can just plug it in and evaluate it. If I know what my co coefficients are and I know what my lambdas are, I just tell you what it is at that time. Um, and we showed, we showed how to solve for the coefficients and that this thing converges in this paper. Here's some examples. Here are four different initial conditions. The solid lines that are the numerical solution dotted are these analytic. A lot of times you can't see any difference. It looks like basically these series are almost converging, I mean, very close to t equals zero for these first three. Here you have to wait until about t equals two, and then you start to see your convergence. So it's not that we're, I just should be clear. It's not that these things are converging to your, e to your equilibrium. That, it's that it's actually, the solution is converging at every point in time to the true solution. Okay. And now we can use this to start to answer why are these reduced models doing so well? It's because that in a lot of times you have decay in your eigenvalues. You have this decay 
and, the, and then you have decay and then you take the exponent and those term, a lot of these terms aren't doing anything. So these reduced models are picking up those first important eigenvalues and they're picking up your equilibrium, your correct equilibrium. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, anyway, yeah, this is actually using a reduced model that we calibrated like in the old work, not knowing this stuff we calibrated. And then we went back and found what, what system is it calibrating to? And it's calibrating to the one that's picking up the right eigenvalues. Okay, so just to conclude, what are some big questions moving forward? So I really would like, so think in the Gaussian case for independence and conditional independence, everything is easy because you can see everything, not just correlation or what are called partial correlations, but you can see everything about independence just from those two matrices. And one's the inverse of the other. I wanna do the same thing, just general description of conditional independence and independence properties for arbitrary multivariate continuous distributions. Um, also like a more, right now this um, spectral power series method is you know, it, all done in terms of these linear and quadratic right-hand sides, but I think we can extend this to many, many more systems and relax some of the previous assumptions. If you've seen anyone here, Koopman operators, this actually is very similar to that, but what's nice here, which Koopman operator theory is much more general, but they don't tell you what your eigenvalues and your eigenfunctions should be. And here we actually do. So it's kind of the flip other side of the coin. It's specific to a system, but we tell you what those functions are. And then of course, there's always more complex models to look at. Here are some new projects and collaborators I talked about today. When our department was Sriram and Galtham, we're starting to look at probabilistic programming for hybrid systems, also lots of ODEs there and reduced systems, so that's great. And I don't know anything about probabilistic programming, so I'm learning that from them. Um, in the OE department, I've been working with Tamara and her student Phaedra about this sort of information theoretical approach for catch attacks. Cool to me. So I'm that's been a lot of fun. And then um, even more recently, um, I went to graduate school at UT Austin with Talia, and um, we're starting to think, she does a lot of really cool work in storm surge modeling um, and is at Emory in Atlanta. So that's really, anyway, so we're gonna, we're, we're starting to think about some UQ for those problems. Um, just last little items I want to acknowledge funders. If any of you are interested in this type of work, um, you're very welcome to come join our reading and research group called Upscale. And um, we have it this fall, um, Tuesdays at 3.30. And next semester in spring, it's actually gonna offer it as a one credit course. So you could just sign up if you want a one credit. And then, okay, just one more slide and then there's no math. Okay, and just to end, I wanted to put this quote from Ivo Babushka, who was at UT Austin for, for much of his career. And he passed here, and he was a really wonderful and amazing person, um, a, a mathematician and an engineer. And he asked the best questions during colloquia and just had this sort of sense of curiosity and wonder, and rigor and, Anyway, just really influential for me. Um, and he would sometimes ask, because it's one, kind of one of his catchphrases, would you sign the blueprints? So I always think about that, because you know, if we're trying to model and we're trying to describe what's going on, and you know, eventually, why are we doing all this? We're doing it so someone can use it, right? So we can make something better or build something stronger. And so I like to keep this quote kind of in the back of my mind as I'm working on things. So I will end with that, and thank you so much. Thank you. So this one slide where you show a typical measure map between the multivariate Gaussian to a banana distribution. Do you think that your estimation method could carry over as expected when the banana is now of a different, say, Donut or multiple apples, like a different ecological 
uh, shape. Sure. So if you had half of this banana and then the other half over here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you're almost seeing a 1D on it in that other example where you get those two modes on your ring, on your boundaries, right? So, yeah, there's, so what, you mean, so this estimate, this is kind of non-paranormal estimation. Yeah, so, um, yes, because if, so the, the, the key thing is not really even what that function looks like. It's just that it's just doing one variable at a time. And so that some that seems to sort of not mess up these these matrices, which are really about interactions. So if you start to mess with your interactions and you take a function of two variables at a time, then you're not then all of those results will not hold anymore. I think I had a follow up. I mean, very similar question here because I I mean the way you parameterize it, wouldn't those push forward and pull back be continuous mass? Yes. So so you would you would still go from a connected set to a connected set, right? You can't quite have that without having this specific maps. Right. Uh, yeah, so so we'll okay, we'll assume that there's still some pot, you know, small as you like, but very epsilon density between those two so, so spots. The, the question I had was have you looked into normalizing flows or the kind of maps that people it's very similar. Yeah. Okay. And let me let me clarify one thing first. And then so this map, this map is not one variable at a time. This is my transport map that I'm using to represent my density. All the stuff about the S, the non-paranormal, that is strictly a one variable at a time thing. But my in general, my transport map is, is transport map is not. It's def, it's it has what we call this lower triangular structure where the kth component in general, has to be able to dip variables one through k through k, and it's continuous and it's monotone, and because it's it's monotone in the kth variable, then that gives you diff, um, uh, invertibility. Okay, so that just to separate those two normalizing flows. So you can use you can use whatever map you want for that step. Right, so you don't. It doesn't. Well, and what I showed today, there's, there's. I didn't tell you why exactly that particular map is so nice, but that comes into this part because now, if you if you use a normalizing flow here, you lose, um, you lose this connection, and yeah. So so basically, if you if you once you, if you get a, a good first guess of the graph, then you can use that information to say, oh, actually, I know a lot of those variables drop out and you can have an even sparser map. But that's only true if you have this, the, this type of transport map. Yeah, but if you don't care, if you just wanna do it one shot, you can, if you have a transport map that you like better or is faster, then absolutely you could just use that instead. Yeah. But, yeah. More questions. I, I had one more follow up here. Mm -hmm. So, so the I, I assume that the reason you're you're using a transport map is because directly trying to estimate that that uh, omega uh, through Monte Carlo simulations, you probably wouldn't you would get very poor performance, right? Like just yeah, and how? Oh, I guess you wouldn't even be able you don't, to do that. I see it's because of that. Okay. Because you are taking a derivative mm -hmm. of the function. Okay. Right. You wouldn't be able to do it directly. Right. If this were just a function of your samples. Right. Yeah. So, so in a sense, you're approximating pi by the composition of a transport map and the function. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right, so if there are no further questions. Oh, oh yes, yeah. Questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the side where you're decoupling, or say it was decoupling the controls. Yes. Why, like, what is that? Is, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, like, decoupling the controls. Yeah, because I went through that in two seconds, right? So, 
So the idea, um, so this, there's three subdisciplines that go into one big computational model. And at the end of all this, these are the two quantities of interest, this total power and area of solar array. These are two variables that are typically the quantities of interest here for this model that just come out of, that are just coming out of this power. But these are all, these and these and these are all coupling variables between these different systems. And, um, and so you can run this whole model until convergence, passing these variables back and forth, and then you finally get these two variables. In previous work, um, some people had seen that, well, actually, I can, I can do all of that work. I can get distributions for these variables here that I care about. And that's kind of my ground truth. That's the best, where everything is coupled, and you have to run until convergence and all this stuff. Or I can actually, they try just running the power with these inputs and they're random and they, they affect it, but they somehow don't play enough of too much of a role. And they saw that just taking output from this power analysis and getting distributions of these variables, when you just look at power would give the same, basically very close in kolbach liebler divergence, very close in distribution, um, these same quantities. And so basically that's what we were seeing so that we could decouple you from our graph just by taking data from the system without actually running it any further. We saw that these were decoupled from the rest. So you could just look at that, those outputs alone, essentially. One we had one from Zoom. Um, Ajit said he has a question about the last result you presented. He just he wasn't, he forgot the slide number. Because there are no slide numbers. The one that I gave This one. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we can unmute. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me or no? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So yeah, thank you for the presentation. So I don't know if Rebecca can also hear me. I, I yeah. can hear. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so uh, what I was wondering is, so here you have this uh, differential equation, x dot, which you, x is capital N dimensional, right? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the objective here? The objective is to solve this differential equation in an efficient way or because, I mean, or we are trying to reduce the size of the ODE such that because, for example, when you do reduction, do you uh, just remove some of the state or you do some change of coordinates? So you deal with new state variables. How does it work? Okay, so, so the question is, what is the point of my favorite result? <laughs> so so, so the, the point of this, work basically is that these systems of nonlinear coupled ODEs are hard to analyze in general. And it's hard to say why a reduced model would even work because you're always just comparing one numerical solution to another. So there's no, it's like, well, you can look at the output. You're just comparing outputs. It's really hard to say anything about what's going on in the model. Why is that model a good reduced model? What is the and output? If you just have numerical output, you know, every system is different. It, what, what can you say? The point of this is that we realized this was known that you could do this for a 1D, like the logistic equation is easy to see that you can do that using power series in 1D. So this is like a multivariate logistic equation, but coupled. And we realized we could do it there too, so that now we have an analytic solution. So now I, I don't have... Yeah, okay, so I, so I know how the system behaves for all time past T naught. It behaves basically according to what these eigenvalues from the linearized system are doing. And what's really interesting is that the coefficients that you get tell you something about your initial condition. So you sort of have this, this kind of 
I mean, what's going on at infinity and the linearized system at an infinity and the initial conditions reflected through the coefficients. Okay, so the point is now, now I have this analytic system. Now I can say something <laughs> about why these reduced models are working. So here there's no reduction yet. Here there's no reduction. But if I wanted to do a reduction, what would I do? I would take the important, the M, big M, important eigenvalues and come up with a system based on those eigenvalues and hope for you know, some spectral decay. I see. So just, this is just a broad comment. So there are... <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I can take that question offline. We can talk later. Thank you. Like a picture that you have like alpha zero zero, alpha zero one. I mean, little indexes by little n. Yeah, what is the type of n? Well, so for the for the n is infinity. Oh, and it's the length of the it's the type of the value. So n is the length of the x one and x two. Yeah, two species, two variables, and like n is vector length. So it's all integer vectors. It's one of these cases where like. Yeah. 
media about the Thank you for I don't understand the reason you're subscribing. And I'm like, I'm like, you just like the earnestness, like you see, right? I'm like, oh my God, I really wish I saw, but I don't. But you do. That's what happens. Like, like you discover something that others don't trust. That's a thing to bring. Yeah. I mean, it's been actually really so I was just trying to say this, you know, but sometimes I <laughs> they, have, they have done it in both my you know, both the case, like all the cases that have they come back about the security of the I've worked as a program version of this, I'm thinking you already saw it also, but yeah, we're allowed to buy, but I don't know if I'm it in, or it's like, for example, I guess, but the doctor's office. You bought this already, yeah. You're able to start a conversation. So, yeah. So it's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah
that's you. And then you're like, yeah, you know, make sure that I'm putting pictures of everybody. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It is. This is like a really fundamental result. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah.
the chat before. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just want to crash, so you might have to like end the Zoom meeting on your own. Oh, and it's just oh, there's a miracle. Yeah, it was always. Yeah, it was always. It was always an ordeal. I'm glad that it didn't boot everyone out. It literally, as soon as Jerome said, let's 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 end the talk and thank Rebecca. My computer died. Oh no, Zoom slides didn't update. Is that no? It was fine. Oh, oh okay. I just wanted to. Yeah. No, he's dead. Okay, I'll just end it. Yeah, yeah it made it all the way through, and then okay. the student's room ended the QA. Mm. Everyone clapped, my computer died. Oh, <laughs> okay. And I was like, really glad I recorded to the cloud today. No.